Well, hello everyone and greetings to you from Regent College and especially from the Regent Bookstore for a book launch event. My name is Jeff Greenman. I serve as president of the college and also professor of theology and ethics and I'll be your host and a moderator. And our book launch today, a great day of celebration for this book right here that I'm holding up, Refuge Reimagined. And we have with us the authors, uh, co-authors of this fine book. And let me just briefly introduce them and we'll get to know them more in, in a minute. Uh, Mark Glanville is with us. Yes, waving, uh, who is Associate Professor of Pastoral Theology here at Regent College on our faculty. He's an Old Testament scholar and a specialist in biblical law. And we're going to hear more today about biblical law and its relevance to this question of refugees worldwide. And he's also has extensive experience as a congregational pastor. Uh, and then also with us is Luke Glanville. Uh, hello, Luke. There you go. Luke is coming to us all the way from Canberra in Australia, where it's 6 a.m. in the morning. So uh, good morning to you. Um, that's tomorrow morning for those of us here in North America. He is Associate Professor in International Relations at the Australian National University. And these two have collaborated on a really wonderful book. And we're going to have a chance for an hour long conversation with them around this book. So let me just briefly tell you how we're going to operate and then we'll launch into our discussion. So I have a series of questions I want to ask them to get into the heart and soul of this book and what they're uh, presenting in it and the arguments that they have. And then along the way, we're going to open it up for a segment for questions from you as our viewers. So please send us your questions. Uh, you can see, uh, we'll see how many, how much time we have to get as many questions in as we possibly can. Where do you send it? Well, easy answer to that. Questions at regent-college.edu. You can just send those along, questions at regent-college.edu, and we'll pick up those questions and we'll get to them as many as we can. And then another announcement before we get going, which is, uh, this marvelous book, Refuge Re Reimagined, is by InterVarsity Press, and they have very kindly offered to give away three, three copies of this book to live stream viewers. So if you want to be uh, in a draw as one of the people to potentially receive this giveaway, you need to send your name and your mailing address to the following. So book giveaway, all is one word, no spaces, book giveaway at regent-college.edu. Now, I must say that this is only open to North Americans because of all the issues around shipping and so on, but there will be three lucky winners randomly selected after today's event. Uh, and so send us name and, e and mailing address to book giveaway at regent-college.edu. So questions and giveaways, a lot going on here, but uh, the main event is, is talking with our co-authors. So now co-authors, I noticed that there's a common uh, last name involved here. Um, and I think I've got the story right that you're actually brothers. So I want to know who's older. Mark is older, Mark's five years older. Mark is five years older. Oh my goodness. So who got into more trouble as a kid? That's what I want to know. I got more detentions at school. <laughs> That's true. <laughs> More detentions at school. Uh, and uh, one of the things you mentioned briefly in the book is that you're actually both musicians. Uh, Mark and many of us in the Regent Orbit know about Mark being a piano player and plays jazz. And Luke, apparently at one point anyway, you were a drummer uh, yeah. and you guys played jazz together. Um, so I want to know what's harder, playing jazz together or writing a book together? Ooh. Good question. I think writing a book together is perhaps harder than playing jazz together. Um, yeah, jazz is very hard to play, but playing it together was always a delight and a joy. So was writing a book. <laughs> but uh, uh, yeah, something um, extra energizing about playing music together. Yeah, so um, the book is dedicated to your mother. Uh, whose name was June. I thought it was very sweet that you did that. She passed away last year. Uh, and I'm very curious about the kind of household that you guys grew up in. Um, you know, there, there's, a, there's a country song, Mamas Don't Let Their Babies Grow Up to Be Cowboys. 
And uh, maybe there's one too that mamas don't let their babies grow up to be scholars. So how was this a very scholarly household you grew up in? How did you get to be two academics that would write a book together uh, out, of, out of the sort of family that you had? How did that happen? I'll let you take that, Mark. Yeah, well, I mean, man, I mean, we started off as musicians, both of us. We both worked as professional jazz musicians and studied at what's called the Sydney Conservatorium of Music, which has a wonderful international jazz course. Um, and actually, it's, it's funny, Jeff, a, a lot of our I mean, peers as jazz musicians ended up doing PhDs, and a lot of them are working at universities now. It's very strange. Mm. So somehow the jazz music thing and the inventiveness, the, the creativity seems to go with scholarship. Um, yeah, so a lot of us were sort of, you know, um, living off, you know, spaghetti and McDonald's fries, you know, in our 20s, and then ended up some point during our 30s doing a PhD. So shifting from, you know, the, the band room to, yeah, you know, the office and, and bookshelves. But Luke and I, Luke still plays professionally. He still plays drums in camera. And I try and make sure I'm playing every day here in Vancouver. We don't play much together, which is a shame. <laughs> but I mean, our household of origin, that was the question. Our mother is, I mean, our parents both loved music and our mother really pushed us to be playing. And Luke took, right, you took up drums as a young teenager and I did piano all the way through. Um, but mum was the center of the hub of that kind of love for music, I think, took us out to concerts and that kind of thing. But neither of our parents are scholars, right, Luke? Yeah, yeah, Dad, dad's um, always loved to read difficult books and play yeah. with difficult ideas with the family. Um, I can remember hundreds of drives home from church where mum and dad were wrestling with the sermon and wrestling with them in front of us and hearing our thoughts. Um, yeah, yeah, it was very um, lively intellectual life at the dinner table, as well as lots of fun and shared stories from school, etc. So I'm curious in terms of your backgrounds and and how did how did each of you get connected to this issue of refugees and um, did, did, did that just uh, suddenly sort of come on your radar or has that been a long term interest or, or conviction and sort of for, for each of you where did you connect personally with this particular issue that you wind up writing about. I think for me I've, I've spent probably much of the last 15 or 20 years first as a PhD student and then as a scholar researching international engagement with mass atrocities. So thinking particularly about what should states do beyond their borders to prevent mass atrocities, genocides, to, uh, to end those mass atrocities when they break out. And I think I, I um, was increasingly realizing that surely uh, a much less uh, costly and a much more effective way to protect populations often is to welcome them into your own country rather than going abroad taking on these risky military interventions often that so often just make things worse rather than better that was where I was starting to uh, arrive at a, a strong interest in refugee questions right interesting great and then Mark what about for you how did you connect up personally with this issue of, of refugees and their situation We don't have any audio there for some reason. Oh, Mark, sorry, or... Jeff. My yep. fault. Yeah, I was pastoring in a, a quite an impoverished area in Western Sydney, Australia, with a high um, population of newcomers, of refugees and immigrants, and sometimes undocumented immigrants. And so as I, as I began to research on Old Testament ethics, and as we were kind of busy with our hands and our heart as a worshiping community, um, my kind of my scholarship and what we were doing as a community sort of came together. Um, so... I mean, I started out, I, my, for the first book I wrote was called Adopting the Stranger as Kindred in Deuteronomy, and that explored this issue in, in the Pentateuch, particularly Deuteronomy. And then we came to Canada, and my wife is also a refugee scholar and advocate, and in Canada, uh, our church here, 20 years ago now, birthed uh, an organization called Kinbrace, and Kinbrace is an organization that offers advocacy and housing and support for newcomers here in Vancouver specifically for asylum seekers who are making a refugee claim 
And so it was just a privilege to, to journey alongside individuals and families at Kinbrace, and also just here in East Van where we live to get to know other newcomers who are perhaps making a refugee claim or just received their refugee claim. So yeah, Aaron and I just have, have the fun of trying to do scholarship and advocate for, for newcomers and at the same time as trying to share our table with newcomers and becoming family with them as best we can. Yeah, sort of no, go that, hand in hand, life and scholarship a little bit. Yeah, no, great. Um, uh, so, could you say a little bit about the the idea for doing a book and the book together? Uh, you've both got sort of common interests moving in a certain direction. When, when, and how did it come about? The idea that oh, I think we should write something together. I had a uh, lovely opportunity to take a sabbatical in Vancouver in the second half of twenty sixteen. Uh, came over with my wife Claire and our almost one-year-old, Arthur, and got to live near Aaron and Mark and the kids um, for two or three months, which was lovely. And we were chatting about our research projects and Mark, we were kind of had this realisation slowly that, that we were finding, that Mark was finding if he presents a biblical argument, say, for welcoming the stranger, someone would often reply, but you're misunderstanding politics. What about... The, the implications of state sovereignty or citizenship. Right. Uh, what about the large scale practicalities of these issues? Right. And I was finding if I was making a political argument to Christian listeners in favor of welcoming refugees, they'd often say, well, you misunderstand the Bible. The Bible do doesn't say the kinds of things that you're assuming it says, or at least it's not as straightforward as you're, you're suggesting. And so we kind of slowly realized that perhaps we had something that we could bring to the table together as um, scholars with differing expertise on questions of biblical theology, political theology, questions of political theory, questions of international relations. And so we thought, let's write a book that and tries to deal with all these questions at once to, to uh, yeah. Yeah, yeah, to yeah, yeah. so, so how, how long did the writing process take and how did you actually manage to co-write a book together? Um, I think it reads very smoothly as one cohesive, there's a very similar, you know, very cohesive style here. That strikes me as a kind of minor miracle with two different authors. So how, how, did, how did you do the writing business and how long did it take? It took maybe 18 months. We just, we kind of, uh, Mark took the lead on the first half of the book. I took the lead on the second half of the book. The first half of the book deals with biblical theology and questions of how churches can and should respond uh, to the plight of refugees. Uh, and the second half of the book does uh, deals with the level of the nation and the level of the global community. And then we just uh, exchanged chapters as they were each drafted and tried to uh, work hard to put them in our own shared voice in some way or another. Um, yeah. yeah. Part yeah. of the journey, Jeff, was we had a, a book workshop, which was an incredible joy. Ooh, yeah. Luke had some funding from his university, Australian National University, and we're, he was able to gather 16 um, scholars and refugee advocates from around the world, um, including Lauren Beliski, who's the ED of Kinbrace here in Vancouver, Danny Carroll, an immigration, evangelical immigration expert and practitioner in, in America, but people from all around the world, Erin Wilson from Europe, and so we were able to gather there in Australia and, and literally fly there and share meals. And on day one, we were able to workshop a draft of the book very thoroughly. And we just spent a whole day where our dear friends would just, just took pot shots at our book just for, for a good six hours. And we're just taking notes furiously as they found problem after problem. And then the next day, these different variety of advocates and practitioners shared papers themselves and the really great work that they were doing. So yeah, that, that was an experience of kinship in itself and it's greatly strengthened the book and gave it a unity. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that, what a great opportunity to have that kind of engagement with people that are very knowledgeable about this kind of issue. That's just, what a, what a privilege, that's great. So mm -hmm. Luke, if you have the book handy, I'm gonna get you to read something. Do you have a copy nearby? I do, I do. There you go. So this is just to, to hear the, the voice of the authors a little bit from the bottom of page seven uh, to that, to that, that sort of first section at the top of book of page eight is where you guys describe what do you hope to do in this book. Um, you say, you know, we offer what we hope is dot dot dot. So if you could just read that, I think it'll give our, our viewers a sense about you know the kind of direction and what you're doing with this 
with this book and then we can start unpacking some of the pieces of it. So you just read that little section for us. We offer what we hope is a faithful, empathetic, imaginative and attractive vision of a way through our present crisis of displacement. We pray that the book will go some way toward equipping Christians to understand that the biblical model for communities is one in which people will relentlessly and joyfully enfold the vulnerable, the marginalized and the displaced and to comprehend how this model can be applied in practice in church communities, national communities, and even the global community. Well, good, thank you. I think that sums up in a, in a summary kind of way, the kind of trajectory of the book, if I could call it that, from the kind of biblical mm -hmm. grounding, and then into talking about churches, and then nation states, and then the wider global community. So in that sense, it's a very comprehensive book that you guys have, have offered. And I just love the fact that, that it brings those two worlds, the world of biblical scholarship and the world in a sense of the political and, and uh, legal realities on the ground together in such a wonderfully organic and kind of integral way. Um, very rare book. And um, so the subtitle, Biblical Kinship in Global Politics. I was struck that it's not and global politics, but, but in global politics because um, you're trying to work a kind of moral model of biblical kinship into kind of this public frame more. And so we just want to unpack that a little bit with you guys uh, as we go here today, and we'll see what questions our viewers also have. But Luke, maybe I'll just start with you. I mean, we'll start kind of backwards in a way. Um, could you just describe, in a sense, what, what, what is a refugee? Uh, and there's other words that are used, displaced persons and, and so on. Who are you really talking about in this book? And then what is the reality, the kind of global reality that you're trying to get people to engage? Yeah, so that's a nice question. A refugee is someone who has been displaced from their country of origin due to persecution, violence, war, um, civil instability. Um, sometimes the definition is um, pushed a little further to include, for example, natural disasters. Um, just to give you a quick sense of uh, what kinds of people are refugees. So right now, the UN, the United Nations says that 80 million people are what you would call forcibly displaced. About 25 or 26 million of those are what are defined by them as refugees in the sense that they are outside of their country of origin, uh, but don't have any durable uh, solution to their plight. They, they don't have uh, new citizenship somewhere else. They're usually uh, just found in refugee camps or in urban centres, 85% of them in developing regions of the world. Mm. Uh, another 45 or so million of those forcibly displaced people are what is called internally displaced, meaning they're still within their countries of origin, but they've had to flee their homes and their communities uh, and are in great need as well. And uh, another percentage of those forcibly displaced people are what, what are called asylum seekers, uh, meaning that they are have, have arrived at the territory of another country are seeking asylum, but have not yet, for a range of reasons, been recognized as refugees. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much. And so in terms of, of that sort of population, 80 million people is a, lot of, is a lot of people. Is that number increasing? Is it decreasing? What are the trends within this sort of phenomenon globally? Yeah, it's increasing. It's terrible. It's, um, I think, only uh, 12 or 24 months earlier, the figure was 70 million. The year before that was 65 million. The numbers have been going up pretty consistently for a decade now. Mm. Um, uh, since the UN started counting these figures, the figure has never been this high. Um, the end of World War II had an enormous numbers of refugees globally as well uh, that weren't counted mm -hmm. um, so definitively. But this is an extraordinarily uh, high point in this issue of refugee displacement. Yeah, yeah, I, I, I learned a lot about this phenomenon uh, from, from the book and from your expertise on this. I'm really grateful that you did such a good job of this. So one of the things that surprised me as a reader was the place, the countries that are, are really hosting more of these refugees. It might not be what most people think, um, maybe even from looking at the media, what they think. So could you tell us what, what is the reality about what countries actually are caring for taking in these, these refugees? Where is, yeah, where? yeah, I think that's such an important question because we often feel in the West, I think, that um, 
because of the way that our politicians can talk about it sometimes or the way our media can talk about it sometimes we we get the sense that all refugees are at our doorstep or all refugees are within our borders uh, seeking asylum but in fact as, as i mentioned before 85 percent of refugees globally are in developing regions of the world in, in the global south in countries like uh, jordan and lebanon and turkey uh, particularly uh, are caring for refugees who fled the Syrian civil war. At, at, at various stages over the last 10 years, one in four or one in six people inside Jordan and Lebanon have been Syrian refugees. There was a point in which half of the kids in Lebanese schools were Syrian refugee kids. So they are really uh, taking on the bulk of responsibility the bulk, bulk of the global community's responsibility for caring for these displaced, displaced people. Yeah, interesting. And so um, one of the things that, that we talk about a lot here in, in Western countries, Australia, Canada, our setting for this today, but probably viewers from other, other places as well, is, is sometimes there's discussion as to whether these refugees want to just come to the West to get a better life, economic opportunity, or whether they really want to go home because that's home for them. It's where their roots are, their language is, their culture, and so on. What's, what's your read on that phenomenon and that whole debate or discussion as we tend to have it in, in the West? Yeah, it's a complex one, and it's hard to get definitive statistics on these. It's, it seems clear that many, many refugees would love to return home, and that, that makes sense. Um, but in any given year, uh, the numbers who are able to return home safely is tends to be no more than 2 million out of 26 million uh, refugees. Um, and many have no desire to return home at all, given the bitter, horrific experiences that they've fled from, or they, they have a strong understanding that it'll never be safe for them to return home. Um, and, and so many continue to seek uh, protection and safety and new home by continuing to move beyond their country of first asylum, as, as the label goes, to the, to the West. Um, and often they're discredited or, or dehumanised in the rhetoric of the West as um, economic migrants, because well, surely you had safety in mm -hmm. Turkey or Lebanon or Jordan or elsewhere, when the fact is refugee camps are not particularly safe, particularly for women and children, can be incredibly unsafe. Um, which is why many don't live in refugee camps. Instead, they live in urban centres, but still uh, their lives can be very precarious. In many refugee hosting countries, they refuse to grant refugees the right to work. Uh, there's insufficient opportunities for schooling for kids, and there's just this condition of unsafety. Mm -hmm. um, and so for many, there's a need, even if they would love to return home, there's a need to continue moving in search of safety and a new life with some kind of uh, guarantee of uh, permanency. Yeah, um, I'm going to turn to, to Mark in a second to talk about the kind of biblical ethic here, but but I'm just curious as to two different factors that might be influencing this that people might be thinking of. One is the ongoing issues around climate change, and then the second is just the the current reality we're all living with globally of COVID and this pandemic. So what's the impact of climate change and then COVID on this whole phenomenon that you're talking about? Yeah, well, so climate change, like it's hard to pinpoint the numbers, but the, it's pretty clear that climate change is already contributing to forced displacement around the world by exacerbating food insecurities and water insecurities, armed conflicts, and forcing people to move. Um, in Where I, I live, there are many Pacific islands near Australia, which literally will be unlivable because they will be underwater uh, or parts of their territory will be underwater in future years. And so there'll be an urgent need for um, displaced people to find new homes. Mm -hmm. um, COVID has uh, really um, had an enormous impact on the plight of refugees and asylum seekers. For starters, refugees and asylum seekers cramped into uh, uh, living in cramped refugee camps or impoverished urban centres in the global south are especially at risk of contracting COVID. And in, in addition to that, I think many states have rightly uh, taken seri a serious look at how they think about the management of their borders because they don't want to um, 
trigger uh, inflow of um, the COVID um, pandemic in greater numbers into their country. But many politicians, I think, have also taken COVID as an opportunity to, as many scholars are putting it, end asylum, um, just uh, violating international law. The international law states very clearly that all people who reach the territory of another state in search of asylum have a legal right to claim asylum. And many Western states have just been putting them back on buses or, or planes and, and sending them away, using COVID as an excuse mm. while, while leaving their borders open to other wealthier people who they would like to uh, continue to have the opportunity to welcome into their country. Right, right. Well, thanks very much. I think we'll come back in a little bit, uh, Luke, and say a little bit more about what what are some alternatives and some better ways forward than, than the sort of treatment that you've been talking about there. But I want to turn to, to Mark for a little bit here and say um, just how grateful I am for the in-depth biblical scholarship that is at, in evidence in this book, and it, it makes it just a wonderful dialogue. And so um, it seems to me that one of the key arguments, maybe the key argument of the book, is the relevance and, and, and power of a biblical ethic of kinship brought to bear upon this question of, of refugees. So could you, could you explain what, what you mean by a biblical ethic of, of kinship? What, what, what is that really all about and, and what direction does that move this conversation? Thanks. Yeah, when I was back when I was doing my PhD, Jeff, many years ago, I was just holding the, the variety of ethical texts in the Pentateuch, which sp span from very well-known laws such as the gleaning laws to leave the residue of the harvest to wonderful inclusive texts of feasting, the Ten Commandments and everything in between. I remember actually taking a wedding in Toronto and getting on a plane and sitting in a cafe in Toronto thinking, how do these hold together? How do these make sense? We read them as disparate laws. We see human rights, we see charity, but this isn't our, this isn't our culture. This is an ancient culture. And I just started to play with the hunch that I had that this isn't an individualistic culture like mine. This is an ancient communal culture. It's a culture that was very aware of kinship. And I started to realize that the field upon which these diverse laws, commands, feasting texts, Ten Commandments, all sorts of texts, even the Exodus event itself, even what we see in Matthew, Mark and Luke and Jesus' beautiful fellowship meals, um, perhaps what we see in the Beatitudes, blessed are the meek, they're all working on this plane of kinship. And the fundamental question that clan-based societies were, uh, were asking is, who is my kin and where will I find protection? And if someone was impoverished, if someone was an orphan or a widow or a stranger, it wasn't so much that they were looking for charity, but they were looking for the protection of kinship. Who will enfold me as kin? Will my extended clan enfold me as kin if my husband has died or if my father has died? And especially, well, the other side to that coin who do I have kinship responsibility for? You think of Boaz and Ruth, for example, and kinship responsibility, which was quite ambivalent in that story. What's Boaz going to do? How responsible is he? And of course, it was an open question. At the end of the book, there's a beautiful solution. But it was a crisis of kinship in ancient times. Who is going to enfold vulnerable outsiders who are seeking a home? Who's going to enfold the ancient refugee? And the Bible's answer was God's people are going to enfold the refugee. And, and in the New Testament time, the answer was the church, which is exactly the way that the early church lived in the first two centuries, as we know from the Bible and from extra documentation. So this crisis of kinship in the Old Testament and the New, but for now from in the Old Testament, was solved by this, what we have called the biblical ethic of kinship. This bi biblical ethic, which is in reflecting the character of God himself, to enfold vulnerable people as family and to give, to offer community and to offer protection and to offer subsistence. So for uh, one example would be, uh, we spend some time uh, in the feasting texts of Deuteronomy. We also look at Jesus fellowship meals in the gospels and these feasts and these fellowship meals in Matthew, Mark and Luke, the feast of the festival calendar of Deuteronomy 16, they're doing nothing less than forging the family of God. And it's always the vulnerable that are included and honored at the center of these meals as God's people feast together and become family, emphatically with the refugee, the, purple, the, the person who is seeking a home at the center, reflecting Yahweh's loving character who 
this God who enfolded and embraced Israel as his children, this enslaved nation in Exodus, and now we become a nation who enfolds and embraces the vulnerable outsider as family. Yeah, that's fantastic. So it's, it seems to me that, that this category of kin and kinship uh, is just not very familiar to a lot of people. Uh, but from what you're saying, it's actually a, a really central theme in Scripture, both Old and, and New Testament. So how is it that we've missed the importance of this welcoming and inclusion into, into, a, into a kin relationship and kind of God's new family? How, what, what have we missed or how have we missed it along the way? Yeah, fascinating. I mean, it's interesting to know that, to know where it is. It's there in African American scholarship. You know, there's nothing more common. If if, if an African American man will talk, and will will inevitably call someone their brother or their sister, uh, and so so it's there in that that more communal and more kind of ethically carved culture of African American theology and and just culture more broadly. It's there in First Nations culture and theology as well. You know. Uh, Ray Aldred came and visited my, uh, my region college class last week. And he, he just reminded us of that First Nations phrase, all, all my relations. Mm -hmm. And typically Canadian First Nations, well, First Nations people in North America and Turtle Island will extend their hands like this and say, all my relations. And, and, and that's a, a, a sign, not just of all of humanity, but all of the non-human human creation as well. Mm -hmm. all my, this, this thick kind of uh, ethic of kinship between all human beings mm -hmm. and humanity mm -hmm. and the creation. But somehow we've missed it in the West with our hyper-individualized society, as cultural anthropologists and sociologists have called it. We are hyper-individual. And so we, we kind of think of our group, of our people, as generally as the nuclear family at best. It might extend to cousins somewhat, but my family is my nuclear, my, my nuclear family. And of course, uh, you and I, we all do feel a special bond and a special emotional attachment and have a, a special responsibility to our nuclear family. There's no doubt about that. But we need to take our cue from the Bible. And, and Yahweh, the God of Israel, as is a creator of all people, uh, has, I mean, what one lens, Jeff, is covenant. And covenant is actually also a familial category. Just very briefly, covenant is an ancient Near Eastern treaty metaphor. When God makes a covenant, well, the Bible didn't invent covenant. It's ancient Near Eastern treaty, the covenants between the great kings. And this was actually a, a familial relationship. The great king would become the father of these lesser kings that the great king had conquered and subjugated and done terrible things to. But it was a familial category. And in this great kind of creative kind of scribal act, the biblical authors, uh, th there's this revelation of God as a covenant in God. And God makes a covenant, in fact, with all of humanity there in, Ge in Genesis 9 after the flood, the covenant with Noah, the covenant with all of humanity, and, and even with all flesh. And so here is a familial relationship of Yahweh, a kinship relationship of God with all of the creation, with, which is so beautiful. But then this fascinating text, Jeff, in Deuteronomy 10, where Yahweh, the God of Israel, makes a covenant with a stranger. It's a well-known text. Deuteronomy 10, 18 and 19 says that, uh, Yahweh loves the stranger, giving them food and clothing. Therefore, you are to love the stranger. And that word love is straight from ancient Near Eastern treaties. It's a covenant word. And there we see Yahweh, the God of Israel, enfolding the refugee, the stranger, the people on the move seeking a home with a covenant love. So there is kinship. And then Yahweh says, it says in Deuteronomy 10, 19, you are to love the stranger because you're a stranger in Egypt. And here is a call for God's people to extend kinship love to the stranger in their midst. I just want a remarkable revelation of God. You know, I'm a Presbyterian, Jeff. I'm ordained Prezi back in Australia. We love to say Prezi. And we're big on covenant theology in the reform tradition. Well, if we start our covenant theology with the Bible itself, we need to, we need to recognize that our God, the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, is the kind of God who makes a covenant with people on the move. Yeah, no, thank you. Thank you, Mark. That, that's, a, that's a really great answer. So one of the things that struck me as I read through the book was the, uh, a particular New Testament story shows up repeatedly, and sometimes in the mouths of secular politicians, what you would think of as secular politicians, sometimes in theological uh, proponents. It's the parable of the Good Samaritan, which is known to just about everybody, and it's even sort of popularly known beyond, you know, kind of uh, Christian circles. So it's a text that keeps coming up in this conversation all the time about who should we love and who's our neighbor and how. 
so on. So could you could you just say a little bit about this text and how it plays into this whole discussion around refugees? What's the relevance of that passage, particularly for the discussion that you want to have about refugees? Yeah, thanks, Jeff. Well, I mean, just to say, to put that text in, in the narrative arc of the whole of Scripture, um, I hope in our book we have trace, trace that narrative arc and the Good Samaritan takes its place among a litany of texts that unfolds this, this biblical trajectory of enfolding people on the move as our kin. But here in Luke chapter 10, of course, it's a parable of the Good Samaritan. And maybe if I just, just kind of give a quick biblical description and then Luke can apply it to the national and global community. But I'm sure everyone on this call remembers the story where, where a, a, a lawyer says, what's the most important commandment? Sort of challenging Jesus. And, and Jesus says, well, you know the law. You know, what is it? And he says, well, the lawyer says, of course, it's to love God and to love your neighbor. And, and then this lawyer wants to just get one up Jesus. And so the lawyer says, who is my neighbor? And then Jesus tells a story. And the story is a parable of the Good Samaritan. This story sort of unfolds how to love neighbor and how to love God. And you, you know the story of the Good Samaritan. I'm sure everyone on this call knows this story. But the significant thing, it's a very multi-layered parable. And actually, Jeff... Uh, Anticipating this question, I actually sat down on the couch and just tried to jot down before this call all these layers in this beautiful story. Here is a Samaritan. Now, the Samaritan is an outsider extraordinaire to an ancient Israelite in the first century. If you remember, the lawyer couldn't even bring himself to say the word Samaritan. Jesus said, which one of these extended mercy to the man? And do you remember what the lawyer said? Well, actually, the, the lawyer said, uh, the one uh, who extended mercy or something like that. The point is he couldn't say Samaritan. He couldn't bring himself to say Samaritan did the right thing. And so the Samaritan one-ups the priest and the Levite who crossed over and walked by this man. And the priest and the Levite, of course, are being exemplary God-fearers in the Israelites' eyes. Well, what's the message of this parable? Well, sitting on the couch, I tried to jot down three three points. But the first is that that Israel's distorted piety is shown up by a Samaritan. That's the first one. And we just have to just receive that as a church, I think. Israel's dis distorted piety is shown up by a Samaritan. And maybe Luke, when he talks, would perhaps would just unfold that. You know, are there ways in which the church's perhaps distorted piety is shown up by others? But a second part of this multi-layered parable is that Jesus is saying that Israel, Israelites in the first century, should welcome outsiders such as this Samaritan by virtue of the ethic that the Samaritan himself is exemplifying. In other words, in the complexity of the parable, this, this Samaritan is showing this beautiful ethic of embrace that Israel is to show precisely to people like Samaritans and everyone else that they might be tempted to exclude. And then perhaps most beautifully that Jesus is destabilizing his readers', his readers identity in their self-assumed piety. Jesus is destabilizing this lawyer and the whole crowd and all readers of this text in our self-assumed piety, almost relocating mercy in God himself and saying, let's get on board what God is doing and the mercy that God is showing in my own ministry, Jesus is saying, up close and personal, what you're seeing in terms of who I'm eating with and who I'm healing and who I'm privileging. It's very, very interesting. So, you know, it's almost like for us as we consider refugee, a response to refugee and welcome and immigration, it's almost saying, you know what, Mark, Jeff, Luke, you guys aren't going to save refugees. You know, you're not going to go out there and be the saviour of immigrants at the US-Mexican border. It's almost the opposite of that. It's almost like you're going to be saved by welcoming a refugee, that you're going to find God in such a person, that you're going to meet Christ in such a person, you know, Matthew 25 and, and so on. Yeah, no, thank you very much. So then Luke, uh, this is this text, the same text appears in, in a sense, your side of the of the book as well. And some of the figures and politicians and so on that you're engaging and the arguments that they make. So how does this whole parable and who should we care for and, and so on play into the kind of uh, international political side of this? Yeah, yeah. The, we offer an example, um, I think at the beginning of that second part of the book, of Australia's Prime Minister back in 2015, um, who ha had a, a strong record of being horrific towards refugees, um, invoking the parable of the Good Samaritan and saying, well, some people might say that this 
uh, call to love our neighbor means we need to welcome refugees. That's not, and he professes to be a Christian, uh, and he says, but that's that's not at all what this parable means for us. And he goes on to um, justify the horrific policies that he enacted as prime minister. We 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 find it really useful um, at a couple of points in the book to think with this parable to get a better sense of the entanglement of us in the West with the plight of refugees. Because I don't, I don't think it's, I think there's more to say than to simply say the West fails to act like the Good Samaritan when they refuse to welcome and care for and provide kinship and home to refugees. They actually, in many ways, act like the priests and the Levites who cross to the other side of the road to avoid an encounter with the refugees. Western states spend billions of dollars each year deterring refugees from approaching their borders, containing them in the global south in various ways, detaining those who arrive at their borders uh, seeking asylum. Australia has for years practiced this policy of offshore detention where anyone who arrives uh, within Australia's jurisdiction just gets sent uh, immediately to these offshore detention centres a practice that was begun by the US uh, in, in the 90s with respect to Haitian refugees. Um, more recently, the US has been detaining asylum seekers in Mexico, et cetera. It's an incredibly, absurdly costly process, money that could be so much more beautifully spent on caring for vulnerable people instead of quite intentionally punishing them to deter others from trying to find home. And then you can take it further, I think, and look at the ways that Western states even act like the robbers in various ways contributing to um, the generation of situations of poverty and instability around the world that lend themselves to the kinds of outbreaks of violence and war and persecution that generate refugee um, uh, forced displacement. And you can think of this historically in terms of the, um, the exclusion and the extraction of wealth um, and the, the enormous amount of migration out of Europe into uh, territories of indigenous peoples. Um, historically, that has left so many parts of the world uh, much less stable, much less wealthy than us in the West. You can think of it more recently in terms of the unjust wars that Western states have waged and the insane uh, involvement in the arms trade that just contributes to more and more violence around the world. You can think of our... Um, our exceptionally disproportionate contribution to climate change, which is contributing to the generation of forced displacement around the world, which really makes quite clear, I think, the complicity of us in the West in the displacement of others, which to, to our mind suggests that we really should be very wary of thinking about what we might do for refugees in terms of charity, or generosity, these, these discretionary choices that we might choose to make as Western saviors, as, as white saviors of, of vulnerable others. Really, we need to be thinking about this in terms of justice and, and re reparation and repentance for harms that we've done. Mm -hmm. Thank you for, for all of that. I think that's a key move in this, is the move from kind of uh, generosity, as you're, you're calling it really, to justice as the frame around these decisions. Um, there's another uh, episode, in a sense, an historical episode that appears a number of times in the book. I wonder if you could comment on, which is Angela Merkel and uh, Germany from 2015. Could you say, in a sense, what was going on there? Why is that an important touch point in the conversation of, of the book and your way of thinking about this? Yeah, like it's, it's definitely a complex example and an imperfect example in many ways, but I think at the heart of it, it's a, it's a beautiful example. So in 2015, um, at the height of what was called the Syrian refugee crisis, uh, which um, while media has gone quiet about it, is, just, is still ongoing, um, more than half of the Syrian population remains forcibly displaced from their homes. Um, but in 2015, uh, German Chancellor Angela Merkel opened Germany's borders to asylum seekers fleeing that civil war and fleeing other uh, wars and violence in the Middle East and Africa. And over the next six months or so, more than a million asylum seekers came into Germany. And as I say, it's a complex example. Um, and some of Merkel's decisions in the months and years since have been um, nowhere near as positive. 
But there was this moment there, for, for several months at least, where the German people took enormous joy in this opportunity to welcome uh, vulnerable people in need. Hmm. They were waiting at train stations uh, with posters saying, welcome to Germany, welcome to your new home. Um, and this, this great collective joy that the German people experienced, uh, this great opportunity to, as Merkel herself put it explicitly, to make amends for Germany's past injustices. This, this wonderful collective project um, that was being undertaken. Various research talks about how uh, healthy it is, not just for individuals, but for collectives, for communities, to do justice, uh, and how, how much the happiness that can be generated from that makes mm. oneself and one's community physically healthier. And there was a real sense of that in play in Merkel. And I contrast that to the, I think the real sickness that so many of us in the West feel individually and collectively about how our states, our governments treat outsiders, vulnerable people in need and think of what uh, a much more beautiful way uh, Merkel's example offers to us. Mm, mm, thank you very much. We got a question from one of our viewers that I want to bring in now, which is a really great question. I think it's referring back to when I asked Mark about how have we missed this category of kinship as a really important theological and ethical category. So here's the question from our viewer. Uh, it says, Mark traced the absence of the concept of kinship back to a hyper-individualization of the West. Here's the question. What could be the problem then in those countries or communities that are knowingly more communal, but are not embracing uh, their refugees? Has the West exported its way of ruling? Yeah, sure. It's, it's a complex question. I'll have a shot then. Maybe Luke wants to have a shot. I mean, of course, in some kinship, more oriented cultures, such as Jordan and Lebanon, we've seen incredible generosity and um, I understand it's one in seven people in Lebanon right now are, are refugees, mostly from Syria. And it's well known that 50% of Jordanian kids at school were refugees from Syria. An incredible generosity, at least in those early days of the Syrian crisis. Um, it, nonetheless, the question's a good one. So I'm not arguing for a second that communal cultures are better. That, that's not what I'm trying to argue here. One can critique Western individualism and one should, but Luke and I aren't arguing we must become a communal culture now. No, no, no. Rather, this is simply a hermeneutical lens to understand where the, the culture of the Old Testament and the New Testament. They were pan-Mediterranean communal cultures, which is much more similar to traditional culture uh, around some of the Greek islands today or, or Syria, Palestine today, than the culture that we find, say, in Canada, Australia, and the US, where we might be reading the Bible um, if you're on this call. And so the understanding this communal dimension, this kinship dimension is simply a methodological lens to read the Bible more accurately or, or aright in, in the terms of the people who wrote it and the lives that it was addressing. And so having discovered that methodological lens, then we think, well, what's the Bible saying? And we're arguing that there is this biblical ethic of kinship in the Bible for margin, this, I mean, if I could say it in quite a different way, words that we haven't used yet in this conversation today, but that there's this relentless drawing the weakest among us to the center, drawing the weakest to the center and honoring them at the center of the community. And when it comes to vulnerable outsiders who are seeking a home, that means extending this kinship, kinship protection and solidarity to them. Mm, mm, thank you. Luke, do you have anything to, to add along the lines of that question? Yeah, just, just very briefly, with, with respect to some of the examples that are sometimes invoked of uh, communal cultures um, mistreating refugees. I think currently the examples that are often offered are Turkey, Lebanon and Jordan, who, as the Syrian civil war has dragged on now for a full decade, have started to, in recent years, coerce vulnerable refugees to return to Syria or to return to other crises, to conditions of unsafety, to ongoing wars. And really, to kind of address the second part of the um, questioner's question, I think that there's a real sense in which the West is again implicated in this. The West has, has done far too little to assist um, these countries that have taken on an enormous bulk of uh, the global responsibility to protect refugees. Um, they pr provide uh, much uh, 
yeah, enormous shortfalls in humanitarian assistance, which is, of course, why so many refugees continue to move in search of asylum elsewhere. And so there, these states are exasperated by this shortfall in assistance, and also they're goaded by the many examples of Western states mistreating refugees and forcibly sending them out of their own territories. So really, I think, yeah, that an important part of the story is the example that the West has set. Mm. Mm, thank you. I'm just conscious that our time is starting to draw towards an end. We could go on for a very long time with this conversation. It feels like we're just getting started in some ways. Hopefully our viewers will get a copy of the book and maybe even one of the ones coming from the draw uh, and, and read it and, and really soak in this uh, material to think it through. So before we go, one of the things I wanted to, to get you to talk about was fear. Uh, you have a very explicit discussion around the, the dynamics around fear, fear of foreigners, fear of strangers, fear of people that are different, fear of what could come of our country or our economy. Uh, and it seems to me you're getting with the conversation around fear to a kind of deeper level of things beyond, in a sense, just the headlines. So I, I'd just like for each of you to say a little bit about how you understand the role of fear and and what is it that, that, in a sense, is part of the Christian story that gives us a different way to respond in light of fear? Yeah, I'll, I'll have a, a quick crack first, and then you can take over, Mark. Uh, so one, one idea that we play with in the book is the way that not only have political leaders, media, and others whipped up fear within Western societies, fear of foreigners, fear of strangers in recent years, in recent decades, but these fears have really become institutionalised in our societies, such that we fearfully engage with asylum seekers at our borders and thus add to their vulnerability, add to the harms that we do, do to them by forcing them to perform their vulnerability for us when we interrogate them. Um, and our, our fearful practices uh, mean that we're distressed when those we do welcome into our country don't turn out to be incredibly gracious and thankful, but instead just, just themselves seem traumatised and uh, wanting to keep to themselves or, or what have you. Um, and so we try to make an argument not only in favour of love for the refugees, but working to institutionalise love, working to develop bureaucracies and procedures and policies that are loving towards vulnerable people that we encounter, engage with, seek mm. to welcome into our societies. Mm. Mm. Thank you. Mark, what would you have to say on this question about fear and the role of fear in this whole uh, navigation of this issue? Yeah, I mean, it's, I think that Luke's said it well. It's how can we replace our narratives of fear to narratives of joy and celebration? Um, there are so many narratives of fear. Uh, they'll take our jobs, they'll turn out to be terrorists. We show in our book how those, how those narratives are quite false um, and are more a platform for conservative politicians to get re-elected. Uh, for example, just very quickly, there's not a single terrorist death in the US in uh, the whole 70 years, we understand, of refugee intake in the US, or that would be uh, 50 years, not a single death from a terrorist attack by a refugee on US soil. So these narratives of fear are, are quite false. and and we show this on in 10 different ways in our book or more, but narratives of celebration and invitation to a feast and an invitation to a shared life is so joyful. There's just nothing like um, eating as Erin and I do when it's not COVID uh, at Kinbrace, which is down the road from our house, um, which is this organization that provides advocacy and support and housing and support as people go through their refugee claim the joy of 30, 40 people eating traditionally cooked meals and share, becoming kin together um, with this shared story, we've survived and we've survived together and we're committed to flourishing together. Uh, the reality is that, that all of the nations on this call represented, probably most of them are made up largely of immigrants and to embrace one another as fully human in the, is a decision to choose joy and celebration instead of fear. And that's where the life is. And that's what we see in our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Thanks very much, you guys. If I have one last question for you, say, say someone reads this book and they get inspired to become more involved with this issue of refugees. 
what would be one or two things that you would point them very practically to do as a, as a response to sparked interest? Well, it depends where you are. If you're in the US, uh, we, we recommend that you might reach out to a refugee highway partnership and check out their website and find an organization that is welcoming and resettling refugees in your state. Uh, if you're here in Canada, uh, you're welcome to uh, perhaps even get on the Journey Home website, and they have an excellent program where churches are helping newcomers uh, to settle and find housing, and it's a way that your church could get involved. Contact, uh, get on the Journey Home website and find that project. You're welcome to find me at Region College website as well and email me, and I'll put you in contact with those people. Um, but I think that another thing that you can do is, in fact, just to get a reading group going at your church and start to learn. So you might, for example, meet for once a week for five weeks and learn together and discuss together and then prayerfully consider what might be one practical way you can get engaged. Great. Luke, what would you say in terms of if someone wants to engage this issue, what would you recommend? Yeah, similarly, in Australia, there's there's wonderful groups like Common Grace um, that um, do wonderful work advocating on behalf of refugees. I, I think the main thing I would say is, is join with others who are, who are doing this work and this thinking. Um, yeah, join with others who are already out there doing it. Well, thank you. Very, very good tips to get involved. And it uh, feels like there's so much more we could be saying about this book. But to our viewers, this is a superb book. Very, very unusual book, bringing the biblical and the practical international legal side of this issue together. And so thank you, Luke, and thank you, Mark, for joining us for a really great conversation. Thank you, thank you to all of you uh, who have been viewing us. And uh, we'll call it uh, a day there. Our time has gone. But thank you guys for being with us. Thank Thanks, you for, for joining us uh, as viewers. And we look forward to the next conversation about another great book coming down the road. Thanks. Thank you. Thanks See much. you later. See you.